podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to a new podcast, The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello everyone. On today's podcast, I'm going to talk about Roy Rocket, a horse who captured the racing public's imagination and their affection. Roy Rocket, very sadly died of a heart attack on the 9th of April at the age of 11. And I'm pleased to be with his trainer for all those years, John Berry. How are you feeling now, John, about Roy a couple of weeks after? Well, there's an empty stable in the yard and there's a someone painfully absent from the daily routine. But um, life goes on. Uh, yeah, life different and lessened but it goes on and what actually happened that morning well he was bowling along up railway land the place where he turned for home and go really enthusiastically following in a horse on little gone about two two and a bit furlongs and suddenly it felt as if if you equated it to a car the engine was turned off and we had a blowout at the same time and and fortunately, from my point of view, I realised something was going badly wrong and basically pulled him up straight away and he didn't drop down straight away. But it, it, it was then a few seconds. But from, from my point of view, fortunately, I've had to pull him up and get him off him before he did and he died very quickly. And which was horrible and yeah, all the more shocking for being how totally unexpected it was. But, you know, lots of times when things go badly wrong, they are totally unexpected. Um, but yeah, that was it, really. Um, you must miss riding him out and him being around the sta- stable so much. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, but as I say, you know, I mean, everyone, everyone is bereaved at some point in their life, whether human and or animal bereavements. I mean, uh, and you know you just i'm certain you know it's 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 a fact of life um you know we we, we've all lost loved ones humans and animals in a way losing an animal it shakes you up an animal that you love shakes you up more than you losing a human that you love in the sense that unless you're talking about losing a child you're not responsible for the human the way you're responsible for an animal um but no i i, I mean i'd be you know we, we, we we've we've all we've all grieved at some point and we're assuming we live long enough we will all grieve again at another point on today's podcast we're going to talk about um his 68 race career but what made roy a handicapper so special in the racing public's eyes well, if he'd won nine races at nine different courses, no one would have really noticed. Um, but, you know, people people remember course specialists. People notice them more. Um, you yeah, know, Rapid Lad at Beverly was one of, one of the one of the great classics, tempering at Sobel. Um, and particularly being a course specialist at Brighton, which is a real, really characterful course, uh, always a very strong, strong following. You see the same regular people there every time. Um, and in being a white horse, you know, everyone, lo- everyone loves the grey, particularly once they turn white, which he did quite well. Um, and, you know, I mean, obviously he was beaten a lot many more times than he, than he won, but he'd all, it, he plainly did his best every time. And, you know, he always came with a bit of a run in the grace, whether, whether he went on and won or not. Um, and then at the races as it was then and the racing post in particular they both really picked up on him and gave him plenty of publicity and uh, just everything just combined to mean that he was a horse that had a much a much higher profile and 
and he, he was he was a very character, characterful horse. And as I say, thanks to the publicity he got, people were able to see that. And yeah, he just became much better known and more widely loved than nearly every other horse at that level of the of the ability pyramid. And, and in fact, at nearly <laughs> nearly every other horse. Nearly every horse at the high levels of the ability pyramid as well. It was it was just it was just a, it was just a pleasure to be part of his story. Well, he he was bred in France in April two thousand and ten. How did he get his name, Roy Rocket? Yeah, he's. I uh, well, I still own his dam. She was I bought her as a yearling for Tony Lebrock, and trained her. Him, her for him as a two-year-old and she went over and did well in Jersey and Tony very kindly gave her to me as a broodmare when she retired from racing about the age of eight and the first yeah I had the first year there was a stallion at stud in England at Upperwood Farm whom I, I had previously trained largesse so you know that was a sentimental um, choice of first mating and at the time I sort of thought that there were a lot more stands attractively priced that one would want to use in France than in England. And you'd still get one and a half euros to the pound bend. And it just boarding her in because I, I couldn't keep her here wherever she was, so she'd have to board it board somewhere. And just boarding her in France and going to stand means there seemed uh, the way seemed to be an appealing option. So uh, she went to Harrow de la Cauvinière and lived there for the best part of 10 years. And the first stallion I wanted to use was Gold Away at Harrow Duquesne. And then her second covering, I wanted to use a Son of Sunday Silence because there were a couple in France at the time. And so she went to Layman at Harrow du Logis. And Roy was, uh, Roy was the upshot of that mating. And he's Layman. Minnie's Mystery, she's called it. I mean, I suppose as a lot of horses have main, main names that don't mean anything, you know, just aren't words, they're just letters put together. And they're very hard to name the offspring from. Minnie's Mystery, I've never had, ne for me, I've never really found anything particularly obvious to come out of Minnie's Mystery. But layman, the stallion, of course, in Old English, a lay is a ballad. A story put to music, put to music. So the layman is uh, the song man, the, the musical storyteller. And one of my favourite singers is an Australian called Graham Connors from Mackay in Queensland. And he's he's very much in the Harry Chapin tradition of his songs are stories put to music. You know, Harry, Harry Chapin's great. Live, great live albums, greatest stories live. Um, and Graham Connors are very much stories put to music. Well, and so, you know, that's, I thought, well, they're both singers I like very much. And I thought, well, Graham Connors, you could, in the old, the old English use of the word lay, great, you could say, describe either of them as the lame, as the lay man. But Graham Connors has got one song called Roy Rocket, who is, it's about the singer in Mackay when he was a few, you know, be 10, 15 years older than Graham Connors, who was, he tried to have a go as a professional singer and gone down to Sydney when he was a teenager, but it hadn't taken off and he'd given it a few years and he'd gone back to Mackay and got a job in the, as a mechanic. But he, he still, still loved the music and he'd play in the hotel every Saturday night. And he, Graham Connors wrote the song about him, Roy Rocket. And I just thought, well, Graham Connors is the layman, but Roy Rocket's the layman as well, the song man. And I just, with the alliteration, Minnie's Mystery, Roy Rocket, two M's and two R's. And it's a song that I really like. It's, it just, it just appealed. There's a, I liked the name. I thought it was fitting. And, well, it turned out, you know, turned out to be quite a fun name for a fun horse. Yeah, didn't it? What and it, and he became a story like, um, like the singer as well. His first race 
was on the 24th of October 2012 at Newmarket. What do you remember about his first run? Well, I remember we had two horses in the race, and I've not got many levels, both making their debut. Um, I remember the day clearly, walk, we walked them over. It's an overcast autumn day, walked them over from the stable together. Um, Hannah Nunn, who was my apprentice, she rode Roy, Eddie Hearn rode many levels. Roy was, well, he was a, even as a two year old, a light gray, but he looked such a baby, he looked like a big foal, really. Um, and yeah, him walking around just chucking green as anything, but he showed, he showed a modicum of ability. And funnily enough, there was another nice horse came out of the race. A horse, I think, might have been with Barry Hill, might have been with Barry Hills, but he ended up, went to Paddy Butler. Oh, it's an Arab name, I can't begin to them. Um, and he's, he's won quite a lot of races for Paddy Butler and has become a, you know, another really real stalwart. And when I just looked back on the race a couple of years ago, I thought, gosh, SG made the day during the same race. That was, that was quite nice. Well, he ran three times as a two-year-old, um, two times as a three-year-old, um, then eight times as a four-year-old, and then as a five-year-old in his 16th race and his first time visit to Brighton, he won. Why did you decide to go to Brighton? <laughs> if all else fails. Um, well, he was low in the handicap by that stage, and when you get them down, raced in the 40s, you don't have that much choice where you go. Uh, there aren't that many class six races, and if you're racing in the 40s, there aren't that many class six races you can get into. So I thought it was worth, you know, Brighton's, a tricky track and a lot of horses with proven form go there and don't show their best form. Um, so if you've got a horse that, well, leaving aside horses have already been to Brighton and shown they can handle it. If you've got a horse that you think, well, assuming nothing goes wrong, this horse ought to win his next race, Brighton wouldn't be the place you'd choose because you'd be expecting the unexpected. And, but the sort of opposite applies. If you've got a horse that's running badly and, on form, he ought to be at the back in his next race, and you, you're looking for something different. The course where you can expect unexpected might well be the place to go, and it turned out that that was the case. And uh, seven days later, on the uh, so his first first one, I think twenty first of April, and on the twenty eighth of April, he won again. John Egan being the jockey on both occasions. Yeah, John was. Jo- John was a big part in the story. John, John's ridden for me. John came over from Ireland in 1997 and came over mid, mid-season. And I think his first ride for me was August, middle of August that year. And that one, and his first five rides for me all won. And that was in the summer of 1997. So he's, I've used him when I can ever since then. Um, but there was, he was out of the country for a few years. He'd gone back to Ireland and well, he, he'd been riding overseas and he'd gone back to Ireland and started he was training and riding simultaneously. But then David, his son, was sort of getting towards being old enough to leave school and start racing. He was going to apprentice over here and John thought, well, I'll come back to Britain and start riding again in Britain. And I'll be here to help oversee David and do what I can to help him, which, of course, you know, a few weeks ago, David read the winner of the most valuable race in the world. Um, so, and he's, you know, he was champion apprentice in his second season and you know, it's gone really well. But anyway, so John had just come, we just came back to Britain at the start of that year. And so, I mean, he hadn't ridden Roy before that year. Uh, I think he then had one run on, rode him once on the all weather late in the winter. And he was not long back in Britain, and the horse actually ran better than he'd been running because he was a he was a bugger as a young horse. He'd do so much wrong, he's difficult. So all pulled hard, and but you know if you if you could, if you need a horse that needs a lot of riding, even now John's 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 over fifty now, but even now if you need a horse that needs a lot of riding, John Egan is still the best jockey for him, and yeah, that was. I think that, that's the first time John had ridden him on grass and the second time had ridden him. And 
you know, as I say, Roy, Roy was still doing an awful lot of things wrong in his races at the time, still very green, and getting John on in was a, was a big, big help. Well, Roy won, won again in June 2015 at Brighton. Um, after that, did you build his season around going to Brighton? Yeah, we did. We did. It's, you know, if you take a horse to Brighton and they run worse than usual, which very often happens, you probably never go there again with him. Take a horse to Brighton and he runs far better than he's ever run before. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. You keep going back, and we did. And why did he like Brighton so much? Um, I, I think a lot of things helped. The we'd found as very hard. He did need to be dropped out the back in his races, and even last year as a ten-year-old, if you sort of tried to put him in the race early on, he just pulled too hard and pulled his chance away, and he'd weaken at the end of the race. Um, but of course, you know, nowadays jockeys have got so clued up as regards judgment of pace that to get a race that's run too quick, too fastly, too strongly run race that will set it up for back markers, they're hard to find. But at Brighton, they happen a lot more often than normal simply because of the layout of the course because mid race so much of it being downhill encourages horses to kick on at that stage so they or well, the cliches get racing quite a long way from home and you know if you've got a horse that's sitting at the back the last thing you want is every horse to be on the bridle three far on from home because you're just not going to make up the ground um but at brighton they often get racing quite a long way from home and added to which it's got one of the stiffest finishes in the country, which unless you go there, you probably don't appreciate. But if you go and stand at the two furlong pole, you're looking up a steep hill towards the finish. So it's one of the few courses where preferring to race from the back of a field is not a disadvantage. Um, added to which is you often get quite small fields. If you're sitting last in a seven runner race, you might be eight, nine lengths off the lead. If you're sitting last in a 20-run race somewhere else, you could be five lengths off the lead. And obviously, it's easier to make up nine lengths than 25. Um, plus, he, he loved firm ground, and you very often get firm ground there. Well, he, he ran at Brighton 31 times, um, winning nine races, second twice, and third six times. He must have built up a real sort of cult following, a celebrity at the, the Sussex course. Yeah, he was. It was very moving the reception he used to get um, just for being there. Um, and uh, his, la- his last season of winning, when he won three times there, the receptions he got after the race were, you know, they, they, they blew you away. Really, you know, you know, you, get, you see the you see the Grand National Top and Gold Cup, and you expect to see that. But it, you know, it's 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 rare to see a winner being warmly cheered and applauded as he was he was there and but as i say he was he got he was very warmly welcomed even before the race that night after so at other courses did he like any other courses apart from brighton i know you said he nearly won at lingfield uh, came second there yeah i think i mean the topography of lingfield turf track and the topography of Epsom are very similar to Brighton, both with the downhill run into the straight and Epsom, you have then got an uphill finish. Um, Epsom, of course, you tend to have better quality opposition. You run some nice races there, particularly a couple of times in the Moe, what used to be the Moe and Chondon Amateur Derby with Ross Burkett. But of course, you just get better opposition there. Plus at Epsom, the uphill finish isn't as stiff. The finish at Epsom isn't as stiff as at Brighton. And at Lingfield, you've got that downhill run, which again, you've got to be able to handle, and not every horse can handle the downhill run into the straight, which is why the Lingfield Derby Trial is such a great derby trial. But it's an easy finish at Lingfield. You, 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 it's not a stiff, not a stiff climb in the, in the straight. So, yeah, they sort of suited him to a degree. Funny enough, the nearest he came to winning elsewhere was, of course, I would have said he would never have had any chance at. 
which was Windsor, which has become synonymous with you have to race on the pace because the bend, it was all of that, but the, the bend at Windsor seems to be very tight nowadays and the jockeys really have to sit still on it and nurse their horses around it. And although it's you know, probably four furlongs to the finish when you come off the bend, it's a flat four furlongs and you can get quite big fields there. So no one wants to sit go five, four or five wide around the bend. So if, because, uh, you know, you start the bend, what, seven furlongs from home and you end it four furlongs from home approximately. Every the leaders are always hard on the bridle when you come off the bend four furlongs from home, full of running because the jockeys have all sat up, nursed their horses around the bend. No one tries to make ground around the bend because that's just a recipe for running wide. So in a big field, if you came off, turned into the straight at Windsor in last position, it would be normally virtually impossible to involve the finish because you just you'd be making up ground on trying to make up a lot of ground on horses in front of you who weren't tiring. But of course, the one time where the normal rules wouldn't apply would be in an amateur race. If you get a few strong horses who are probably going to run a bit free and go quicker earlier on than the riders want. And that happened in an amateur race and he turned into straight miles behind the behind the leaders, but they had gone too quick and they, yeah, the horse in front weren't going very fast. And Ross used to run, Ross Burkett used to ride him so well. And Roy went so well from him. Roy came storming home under Ross Burkett and nearly won for his second. Um, but yeah, that was after, after even at the time, even though I'd run so well, I thought, well, I won't run here again unless it's another amateur race because that just wouldn't have happened in the professional race. But yeah, that, that was that, that was the nearest he came to winning anywhere else. But, most times when you ran elsewhere, you, you didn't you didn't get close. Well, last season he had two runs, two runs. We couldn't run at um, Brighton, and uh, we're recording here on the twenty sixth of April. Would he have been running tomorrow at Brighton? Because that's the first racing back at Brighton on the twenty seventh of April. Well, yeah, they've had one meeting, and if you'd asked me that question in whenever it was, end of February, when the pro- when the April program book came out, I just said you'd go to Brighton twice in April because I think there was a mile and a quarter at one meeting. Was it the eighteenth and the twenty eighth? I think if we got a two day meeting coming up, there were going to be a mile and a quarter race and a mile and a half race about ten days apart, and I'd have been aiming to run in both. Um, but for some reason, around the end of March, Brighton's programme for April was changed. And on the three race days in April, there's no race longer than a mile. And I don't know what, there must be some problem far up the track that they can't use the full track at this point. I mean, whether there's roadworks on Wilson Avenue or, I don't know what it would be. But so, no, there isn't a race for him in April. Uh the last time I looked, but they're back to normal scheduling in May, so there have been races for him in May, but of course, sadly, that's academic. But I'd like to think we'll we'll keep going back to Brighton with other horses. Um, and we, you know, we've, we've, we've got a handful of lowly rated class six horses that run middle distances. So yeah, we'll we'll send his we'll send his deputies to see if one of them can follow in his footsteps. And um, talking about uh, Roy as a character at the Beverly House stables, um, did he have his own routine? He must have been part of the furniture, having been there since a, a yearling or a two-year-old. Yes, yeah. He, he's, I mean, yeah, he arrived as an autumn yearling. Um, so, yeah, this autumn, he'd have been here for 10 years. I remember when he arrived, the big pen out of the yard, he came off the truck from France. And I remember putting him out in that pen. Um, and obviously, when they, when a horse first arrives, you don't know them. You don't know. You don't take any chances. You don't. You know, Samar Prescott's got a great phrase. What he said: most horses, most horses spend their lives trying to kill themselves. You've got to, you, you've got to try and <laughs> try and prevent them from doing so. Because you know. Horses, having a lot of horses running around, it's like having a lot of children running around. You've got to have eyes in the back. 
you know, when you've got young children, you're forever thinking, take my eyes off them, what are they going to do? Are they you know, going to sit around and see they're climbing on the roof or they're sticking their fingers in an electric plug or whatever? And, you know, it's a little bit like with horses. It's, it's anticipating what things might go wrong when you're not looking. So, you know, by and large, my stables run in a routine to minimise the chance of anything, you know, or doing something stupid and hurting yourself. Um, you tend to find the longer you've had them, and particularly if they're sensible, the sort of more leeway you can feel, you feel you can give them. You know, the, the, the longer they've been there, the more they know the place, the more they know the routine, the more you know them. And you, you tend to find, generally find you, you feel confident to give them a bit more freedom, a bit more leeway. Uh, do this as a treat, give him, do this, do that. And, you know, whether it's like leaving the stable door open so they can wander in and out or, or you know, that's the most, that's the most obvious one. And yeah, it, it, certainly his last few years, he had more leeway than most. And what well, was so nice because he, you know, he clearly so enjoyed having that, having that, having, having the freedom of the place. And, you know, you'd come out and sometimes you wouldn't know where he was. <laughs> he'd be high, he'd be stuck away behind something or, but, you know, it would never be the worry of Christ had gone there. The, 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 oh, the, how are we going to get them out of that without them? The, you know, with him, he'd, if he'd, if he'd burrowed his way into a narrow place where common sense always shouldn't go, he'd just quietly bury his way out. If he was over the other side of the yard, you, you called him, he'd come to call and things like that. And he got on well with your two dogs, is it Gus and Morstan? Yes, yeah, yeah, and Blake, Blakey as well. Gus particularly, Gus, Gus just turned 10 on the 4th of February. So Gus arrived probably middle of April 2011. Roy arrived in September, so Gus was still a puppy. And I, I do, do remember when putting Roy out in that pen in the yard and Gus wandering over and sniffing him and I thought, yeah, you two, you two are going to yeah, introduce yourselves. You two are going to see plenty of each other. And and they did. And did Roy get quite a few, as he got older, visitors and people coming to specifically to see Roy? So you'd always go, no, they'd, you'd make sure they saw him whether they liked it or not. But everyone did want to see him and he he, he loved the attention. And we mustn't forget, he also won an award at the ROA Awards in December 2018, a Flat Special Achievement Award. How well delighted were you when, when that happened? I was overwhelmed. Um, I was semi-overwhelmed when he was nominated. I think about 10 horses were nominated. And it's a way of giving an award to a horse that isn't a champion. But they're normally very, very good horses that win the award. You know, it goes to the type of board that's never the very best. The horse is never the very best around, but he's one of the best around. And when you throw in add, add points for consistency, um, he comes out on top. Um, but yeah, I think Bilston Brook had won the 1000 Guineas. She was a nominee. Our Tate Cover had won the King George Takes yet again, was a nominee. Um, Brown Sugar on the Bundy Cup, another good handicap, and there were some really good horses. God, he's nominated in this uh, in this company, and then he won the award. He, basically every every RA member gets a boat, and he collected more boats than any other horse, which was absolutely wonderful. I I had shingles at the time and couldn't go. I felt awful. Um, physically awful, just a short lasting thing, but it would have wiped me out at all. It wiped me out completely. Just gone on a late night in London, so I couldn't go. So Emma went down, and he, my my co my co owners like Larry and Iris McCarthy were there and had a wonderful night. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm so pleased they were able to go. And I mean, so I was sad I couldn't go, but I actually. I didn't feel I'd missed out by now. It would have been lovely to be there. But, you know, someone said, oh, your horse won an award and you, you weren't there to collect it. That must have been 
awful. And no, no, it wasn't awful. He won, the, he, won the, he won the award. That was just so unbelievably wonderful. The fact that it would have been even more wonderful if I'd been there, you know, didn't lessen the, how special it was in winning the award. And we got it up on the shelf. And yeah, I, I'd, I'd almost say that's, that's the most special thing that's happened, really. Um, he's, you know, the, the National Hunt equivalent at the same awards was won by Cue Card, you know, who was just such a, you know, multiple grade one winner. Um, but, you know, Cue Card's a classic example because he was never the very best horse around, but over a period of several years. So he never won Horse of the Year, National Hunt Horse of the Year. But, you know, he'd have been in the, on the shortlist for about five or six consecutive years. So when he retired, he quite rightly picked up the National Hunt Special Achievement Award and uh, thought, yeah, yeah. I'm really winning the flat equivalent. It was, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was over, overwhelming. Well, thank you, uh, John, for sharing your memories of Roy Rocket with us. I can tell um, how much he meant to you. Have you got any final thoughts about Roy? Um, not really. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I have and always will have, but uh, nothing that I could really add, just... You know, I suppose it's everything you'd always say. You, you just probably take the things. It was wonderful having him here, but, you know, you almost really, you take take those around you, whether they're human or human or equine for granted, and you just assume they'll always be there. But, you know, they never will always be there. And it's, you know, just a reminder not, not to take, not to take anyone or anything for granted. And, Really appreciate what you've got around you on it's there. Well, that's a, a lesson for us all, really, especially in these very difficult times. Um, thanks again for sharing um, some great memories about Roy Rocket with us here on the paddock and the pavilion. And uh, best of luck for the 2021 season, John. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the paddock and the pavilion. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and now on Instagram at the pad and pad. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network.